Okay, uh, this is lecture 11. Uh, lecture 10 was the exam last week. We've just finished handing back exam printouts. I want to give you a few comments about the printouts, how to use them, uh, how they're structured, and so forth. And then we'll get to some physics stuff in a few minutes. Uh, the exam printouts, first thing I want to point out to you is that they are based on 45 points, not 50. The reason for that is that uh, we had 45 scantron, uh, scantron questions, 45 dots to fill in. They don't know anything about our eye clicker work, so the percentage on their on that printout is not accurate. That is not your test percentage. That's your scantron percentage, but not your exam one percentage because the the clicking points are not on that printout. All right. So the raw score that is on your printout, uh, wherever it is, on the, I think it's at the top somewhere, that raw score is correct. That tells you the number of points that you got from this exam, the Scantron portion. Uh, the cl eye clicker portion of the exam is already posted in web courses. And so you either got five points, four, three, two, one, or zero on that. Uh, and if you didn't get a, if you got a minus one, that means that uh, you didn't have a clicker or you also, if you have a minus one uh, on anything test related, that means we don't have your exam. So for instance, Serrano and those other names, those four students won't have an exam score in web courses until I type it in manually, which I'll do this afternoon. Uh, Darian, please record the grade for each one on the stapled deck of paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, so anyways, uh, keep that in mind when you're looking at your printout. Another thing I want you to look at is um, take a look at your printout very carefully and see if there are any errors on there of this kind. First, are there any blank answers? And I think it'll say blank. Has anybody got one? Does anybody have a blank? Does it say blank in parentheses? Yeah. It just says blank. Now, what that means is you either did not bubble in an answer, which happens, or you bubbled it in, but it's not dark enough. and Or you tried to erase it, and then you forgot to bubble in a new answer. Um, and so, the, so what we would have to do is take your exam printout and then find your Scantron in this big pile of Scantrons. So it's kind of a pain in the neck, but we could do that and figure out what your, if you really do have a blank or if you actually have a really dimly bubbled in correct answer or a really dimly bubbled in incorrect answer. All right, so if it's the second alternative, uh, then you get another point. Otherwise, you don't get another point. It's just, you know, it really was cor incorrect. Now, the other variation to that is two answers. Every question on this test has exactly one answer, A, B, C, D, or E, and no double answers. Now, some instructors do that, but on the, and I do that occasionally, but not on this test. So there's only one dot for each question. If you have a printout that says you voted for A and C or D and E, that means that you bubbled in one of them, you erased it, but not very well. And it counted that erasure as a dot. And then you dot it in another one. And it doesn't know which one um, is which, Leah. So um, it counted them both, it counted that item wrong. Now, again, I can go and dig through the Scantron uh, during office hours or some, or Darian during her office hours can do the same thing and figure out if you really do have two dots or if you have one that's clearly an erasure. And if the one that's remaining is correct, then you'll get a point. If it's still incorrect, then, you know. And if you erase the correct answer and bubbled in the wrong one, you ain't getting that point. And you know what, students? I have seen this on many, many multiple choice tests. Because every once in a while, I have to grade a test where the student circles the, the you know, A, B, C, D, or E on the actual test form. You know the print printout uh, with a pencil, and a lot of times, so I go through and gr grade it by hands, and or grade it by hand, and 
a lot of times I'll see the correct answer circled and erased and then the wrong answer uh, circled and I see that so many times and that's why they say your first answer is usually your correct and if you replace it it's usually wrong with a wrong answer now there's an exception to that if you obviously remember you know the you know the, the answer the correct answer you know it comes to you like a bolt out is it a snake oh stop the show we had a snake out this no I'm did you you know snakes are they, spiders have a lot of protein did you is everything did you, did you kill it you killed it you killed it did so you're cruel to animals right yeah okay I am too so that's all right anyways good we had a snake outside the door here the other day and Darian saw it and it freaked us both out for a minute no, it wasn't that big King Kong Ray. It was just a, it was a little teeny thing. So I, I sm smushed it under my foot, as you're supposed to do. Yeah. The web course, the clicker questions, the question is, there's no room for error on the clicker questions. Um, there is, and I gave partial credit to a few students on uh, question one, and a partial credit to a few students on number on uh, uh, on question two all right so I've already done that and so what's posted is the is the credit or partial credit that you have earned or a zero if you didn't if you didn't get any all right but yeah there in generally uh, on clicking I'll be able to spot I spotted all that like Thursday afternoon Thursday night when I was combing through that gave everybody partial well gave a bunch of people partial credit because it was you know like somebody typed in 1.97 which is the correct answer for number one uh, and they and they typed it in for number two and then they didn't have any answer for number one or they had like Z or something like that you know obviously not the right answer so I gave that person credit for number one and but nothing for number two so I can see that stuff easily when I, they're still giggling over there. The spider is dead. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the, you get a. It's it's possible uh, to get uh, partial credit on that, which is what I like about clicking. And then the and then on the uh, on the scantron, we got these two. You know these two uh, these two blooper variations, okay. Now, since this spider incident is squared away, I hope. Okay, uh, I want to mention to you that this printout that you now have can actually be a very nice study tool as you get ready for the final. So, you know, end of December when you're starting to get ready to f study for the final, which you better which you now know after my first exam that it ain't a walk in the park to get an A in this class. All right. You really got to work your you know what off. So you're going to want to study for the final. But what, what you can do as you study for the final of all the things is use this um, printout. Now, every exam, I basically scan the answer key as it's printed out by my software and I call it the blurb sheet there's one for each exam form A B C and D and I put those scan files in web courses for you to download as a PDF and those answer keys have the right answer and then they also have a little blurb about each question except for the matching but for the true false and the multiple choice of a little blurb that tells you um, cal easy calculation for free fall 
or Newton's third law example or what did Galileo say about uh, inertia or some little clue now they don't have the verbatim question all right but they do uh, have a little blurb so that when the final rolls around you can look at your your printout and see which question you had wrong like number seven and then go look up on the blurb sheet and see well number seven was about you know Newton's second law or something like that and then you will know that for the final you want to study a little bit extra on that topic Newton's second law or whatever it happens to be for your printout okay so uh, I will publish those in web courses uh, this week you know probably tomorrow I'll probably do it during office hours and uh, and so keep that. So definitely keep your uh, printout. By the way, if you got here late and didn't get your printout, we, we only go through the, the list once at the beginning of class. But if we dismiss a little early, uh, or if you can come over to my office for a few minutes after class, uh, we can dig through the pile and get yours, get yours for you. So it's not a problem. And failing that, we'll get you at the beginning of class next, next time on Thursday. Okay, so keep this as a study tool. It's a nice little thing. Now, a comment about the exam itself. The average was 60-something, high 60s. Um, I don't know exactly where because I still have a bunch of grades to, to type in. Uh, but it's going to be in the 60s. We had 500, actually we had 630 students taking it. Uh, I shoot for an average of about 70, so this one's a little low. Sometimes it's a little bit high. Uh, and it's kind of hard to predict you know sometimes I'm right on 70 sometimes a little bit low some sometimes a little high this one is a little bit low uh, but what I I'm guessing that there's a fair number of students in here that think oh man I gotta do better on exam too and let me just remind you that you have a grade scheme this semester uh, in which we drop the lowest score and we keep the best too and for many students this semester many, and semesters past a lot of students it's exam one simply because you are not that familiar with my exams when you get to exam one and you get caught for, caught napping on exam one but by the time exam two rolls around you have figured out the kind of things Dr. B is going to ask on the exam and your grades start going up and that's normal so if you uh, took a little bit of a dip below what you were hoping for, uh, keep your chin up and work hard. And here's a couple things that you can do. Looking ahead to exam two, the things that you can do to get your grades up, first of all, SI. Go to supplemental instruction. If you haven't already, there's a schedule. It's up on the first screen every day. And they're having... Uh, SI tonight at 4.30 over in Classroom Building 1. All right, so get your you-know-what over there um, and go there a couple, three days a week if you can and you will see your grades really improve. Second, uh, start coming to office hours over in the Physical Sciences Building right next door. Now my office and Darianne's are different. Darianne, what time is your... Okay, Darianne is 1 to 2 on Mondays. And she meets in the atrium of the Physical Sciences Building. So just go in the main entrance and you'll see Darian uh, at about 1. And, you know, she'll work with you on stuff. Also, my office hours, we had a ton of students uh, on Wednesday last week, uh, 9 a.m. to noon. And I'll be in room 158, which is just off the atrium. It's a big solarium, a sunroom. Uh, that's set up for office hours with students and that's where I hold my office hours uh, have you ever had office hours there in the sunroom no we like to get office hours. everybody likes to get office hours so Darian could get them this year anyways do that and as I always say the more you can interact outside the lecture hall with me with Darian with the SI leader Shy the more you will learn. It's just a simple equation. Increase the amount of interaction with us uh, outside the lecture hall. Now you're interacting with me 
kind of, but I see, I see somebody on their iPad back there. I see a lot of noses down. Okay, now you're looking up because you're embarrassed, calling you out. But I see a lot of, see, and I can't see what you're doing. See, I see a guy up here in the middle of the row. He's grinning at me like, yeah, Dr. V, I was just in Facebook talking to my girlfriend or whatever, you know, which I can't control that. So these interactions in lecture are, are not so good, but office hours, any kind of one-on-one -on -one time is, is really valuable. And for that matter, having a study partner is also a good thing. Right, so that's item number three. And either a study partner or a study group, if you can find a, a bunch of guys uh, with which you're friendly. And I saw a big flurry of that in uh, discussions last Wednesday and Tuesday, Tuesday night and Wednesday. Everybody's saying, oh, let's have a study hour in the office. Let's have a study group. And that's kind of late days. Start now. If you made friends last week studying, okay, you turn off your phone and get down to business, okay? And and just have a, a, a good study group, and it can really help. Anytime that you're interacting with another human being on the topic of Newton's third law or electromagnetism or anything that we talk about, it is going to help you to understand and to really think. Because to speak, most of you in here, I will assume, engage your brain before you engage your mouth. In other words, you think before you speak a little bit. And studying with a friend, studying with me, studying with Darian, SI forces you to do that. Also, you know, SI, you can make friends with. Matter of fact, that's what uh, Shy and some of my other TAs uh, from a year ago, they met and started really crashing things. They met in SI, then started coming to office hours too, and they started getting really good on their exams by the end of the semester. So, yeah, SI, if, you, if you've if you made a friend with somebody in SI, see if they want to be a study partner. It's really helpful. Okay. Another thing that you can do, and the, the, the queen of this is Darian, uh, leverage the uh, video, uh, the lecture video that we upload into YouTube uh, to rework your notes. So that helps you in two different ways. First of all, in lecture, you can pay more attention in lecture because you're not taking, you don't feel like you have to copy everything down verbatim because it's on the lecture video. Second, what you do take notes in lecture, you can go and perfect them and fill in all the blanks, change the spelling, change the structure, correct the diagram, the, the equation, whatever it is, uh, and you can look it all on the video. This is being recorded right now. Uh, and according to Miss Darian, that is a very valuable thing to do. She told me the other day, after this class, we were filling in the exam keys for every exam that you take, I have to fill in four, one for each exam form, A, B, C, and D, the key. And Darian was helping me with that, and we were just talking. And she said, oh, yeah, Dr. B, I used to always re-listen to your lectures and then change, you know, fill in my notes and polish them up and you know, correct them if, if, if I had something written down wrong. And she said it really helped out. And in general, Darian is also very skilled at how to uh, persevere in this class and get an A. Comment number five, uh, keep an eye on my highlights in the e-text. Please raise your hand now if you have seen my highlights in the e-text. Okay, now keep your hands up, you guys, raise them high. Now the rest of you that haven't and would like to, look around and see if you know somebody that's got their hand raised. And they can help you. Okay, if one of them is a friend, they can help you see my highlights. And I know that there's been some discussion in the discussion board about that, how to get to those highlights. The problem is my software is the teacher version of the software, and I cannot s see it the way you guys see it. So I can't really give you advice, but everybody that had their hands raised can give you good advice on how to see those highlights. 
all right so in general what I want you to do is um, you know follow the Bruce Lee principle you know adapt to what you find you know don't be don't try to force the studying techniques from a psychology class or uh, anatomy class in this class adapt to what we have or as Bruce Lee said be water my friend you know he said you know water adapts to any shape into which you pour it all right the shape that you're being poured right your brain is being poured into right now is physical science 1121 adapt to that and here's five different ways on this list uh, that you can adapt another comment closed captioning and what we've got now is YouTube and for the last two lectures we've enabled closed captioning uh, and all the future lectures will be closed captioned and it looks like this for, for those of you that like to use it I use it myself um, it's down at the bottom of the screen so up here is the regular part of the video and then down here at the bottom see inside this red rectangle uh, with the red arrow pointing to it um, that's what it looks like so that's that's a transcript of me and I was saying exerts on the moon 73 and then you know this is just a snapshot of the video screen so it just streams my whole narration okay and it works really nicely it's very easy for me to do and I'm very very happy to give it to you guys uh, for use it it will very definitely help you and so just so you know I'll be keeping this part uh, down here where it says CC that region of each uh, keynote slide that I have every day I'm gonna be keeping that clear because that's where the closed captions are okay and you, you may notice that in today's lecture now last time we worked out the skateboarder example um, you don't have to jot down this but definitely look at this uh, we had Bob and Carl two different guys uh, but they had the same push force uh, negative 500 newtons that's a leftward push force from Carl on Bob and then Bob pushed with 500 newtons on Carl uh, 500 newtons to the right so the interaction forces were the same size we s decided that after 0.48 seconds of interaction that they had acquired new velocities uh, V subscript FS excuse me V subscript FB for Bob going to the left V subscript FC final velocity for Carl going to the right and we noticed that the forces were the same size but the final velocity was not the same size they were oppositely directed but they were unequal speeds I think one was three and one was six one was, I, I believe it uh, if you can you check your notes uh, I believe Bob was minus 3.00 meters per second is that right yeah okay and then Carl was positive 6.00 meters per second so we had this this kind of a quandary we also had this one that the contact time was the same by definition but the positions after acceleration this moment after acceleration was not by the way the brain burner uh, the main brain burner on the exam was the last clicker question and it was challenging there were a number of students that did get it but um, not everybody was able to get it I did give partial credit to a few people on it but it was tough it was basically to use one half a t squared to figure out a d equals one half a t squared from the um, distance traveled and the uh, the time the travel time uh, and to figure out the a t no excuse me uh, you were to figure out the distance from the ex no I, I take that back you were to figure out acceleration from a distance and a time 
And so it was a little bit trickier, uh, but a bunch of you did get it. Some of the top students got it. So, um, so we're going to try to tackle that symmetry issue today. Uh, if we don't get to it today, definitely on Thursday. Uh, so let's get to some topics. Now, before we talk about symmetry and momentum, I want to talk a few minutes about the Nardo ring. And the Nardo ring and uniform circular motion in general is our topic here till the end of class, probably. We didn't get much past this in the morning class. Um, so this is an overhead view of the Nardo ring, which is a circular test track down in the boot heel of Italy. Here's a picture of Italy from Google Maps. Um, and yeah, this is uh, Nardo Technical Center down here. And it's just a big circular track where um, the Italian automaker Fiat um, uh, tests a lot of, and, and matter of fact, a lot of European automakers test their vehicles. You know, they do endurance runs and stuff like that, test their new equipment. So to, in order to get to uniform uh, circular motion, we're going to talk about curve trajectories in general. So not circular, just kind of a general trajectory. So what I would like you to do is sketch in here a curved path that's kind of, you know, it's not a circle, but it's not straight away. And it's got a couple turns to it, kind of like what I got. All right, so you're basically changing direction as you go through it. And because the direction of travel is changing, your velocity arrow is going to change. And that's no matter what the speed is that you're traveling. As long as the direction changes, you have a change in the velocity arrow. And therefore, you have an acceleration. This is an accelerated path. No matter what the speed is, no matter if you change speed as you go along the path. You know, if you're on a in a car, if you hit the gas as you go along this track, that's fine, you're changing your speed. But even if you go through the track at a set uh, speed, uh, you're going to accelerate. And that's really what we're going to get to. Because there's an acceleration vector, there's also a net force, which is also a vector. Now, at each, th the key to figuring all this stuff out is the radius of curvature of the track. All right, so that's what we're going to try to tackle. At every point on the track, there's a radius of curvature. Now, I want you to choose a point. Here's the point that I chose, this little red square. Just any point, as long as it's not on a straightaway. All right? And so, so try to stay awake and get your, uh, your point up there. And uh, don't let anybody sitting near you fall asleep. Okay, good. Everybody's awake now. And so get that dot in there. And what we're going to do is sketch the velocity vector at this point. Okay. And then after we sketch the velocity vector, we're going to figure out the radius of curvature by imagining an imaginary circle kind of etched in really closely and overlapping the curved trajectory itself. So first of all, draw a tangent line at that point. Tangent is from the same Latin root word for tangible. Tangible means touch, touchable, tangible. A tangent line touches at just one point. So just kind of gracefully, you've chosen your dot, now gracefully draw on a tangent line. All right. Now the velocity vector is either going to be going to the up and to the right, or if you're going back down the track, it's going to be going down and to the left. So we're going to choose this direction for the velocity vector. The velocity vector is always tangent to the path, as I've mentioned before. And so in this path, we're going um, from, the, um, from the left side over to the right side. Okay? And we're kind of squiggling around it as we go. And go ahead and label that with the vector V, just for bookkeeping purposes. And I'll, I'm going to take away my tangent line now. It's already done. You don't have to erase yours, but all right. Now, next thing, we've got the velocity. 
Next thing we're going to do is graph in by hand, uh, and hopefully you can do this gracefully, a circle to represent the curvature at this red square at this point. Okay, now here it is. Take a look at that. All right. For at least a short distance, that imaginary circle is right along the path. All right, so I'm going to back it up here, and here it is right along the path. So kind of ease it. Now, this you can call this a tangent circle, a circle that is tangent at this point, the red point, the red square. All right, so kind of easily just trace it in there as, as well as you can. If you're not another Leonardo da Vinci, you know, Leonardo Jr., don't worry about it. Just do as well as you can because you have the video to go back and, and double check. Okay, so if you're a little shaky on your diagrams, don't sweat it. Just give it a shot. Do what you can, and let's keep going. All right, now, this particular circle here has a center. Put a dot there at the center. Draw a couple diameters. And I've got two diameters at right angles, so they form quarters. Each of those diameters has two radii. So this diagram has four radii, and there's one radius that goes from the center, this black dot right here, out to my red square where my object is. All right, that's where you are as you travel on this path. Okay, that is a radius, a, a locational vector. We could make a locational vector out of that. And it's definitely the radius of curvature. All right, now let's make some notes. Uh, the circle matches the path, even if it's just for a few meters. Okay, we're kind of idealizing it. You know, as they say, close enough for government work. You ever hear somebody say that? Well, in terms of being close enough for government work, you can always find a circle that's going to match it for a little bit of its course, no matter how squiggly it is, even if it's really, really squiggly. The center of the imaginary circle is inside the turn. So if you're turning right, the center of that imaginary circle is to your right. All right, somewhere off directly sideways from you. If you turn left, the imagine that Mary circle would be somewhere off to your left. So um, now we've got a right-hand turn here, on at least on my curve. If you drew yours in up here, this would be a left-hand turn. Okay, you're, you're cranking your steering wheel to the left. In that case, the circle would be over here. It'd be a little bit smaller, okay, and because it's a little tighter turn, and the center of that smaller circle would be off to the left, okay. The velocity vector is tangent to the circle and the path. So if the path and the circle are tangent, whatever's tangent to the circle, or excuse me, whatever's tangent to the path is also tangent to the circle. So the velocity is tangent to the circle. All right? And we are going to use that when we study the Nardo ring because the Nardo ring actually is a circle. That's the way it was designed. And that's my last comment, comment number three here. This, If you do have a circular path, there's only one radius of curvature. Now this one, Sarah, the radius is curving all the way through here. Right here where my cursor is, if you take a look at that, that's almost a straightaway. It's kind of curving a little bit to the left. And because of that, Akeem, uh, it's curving to the left. I have a pretty big circle of curvature for this point where my cursor is. All right? But now when I get down here, that's a pretty small circle of curvature because I'm really cranking. I really got to have good tires at that part of the track. All right? Now, let's figure out the net force. And we're going to try to get just a few minutes more of, of notes on this, and then we'll try to finish up on Thursday and, and keep going. All right, so stay with your general path. And what we're going to do now is consider a course of travel in which the speedometer is constant. So in other words, we're going along this curved path, and we're just keeping it on cruise control at 10 miles per hour. You could do that, I think. 
I don't have cruise control, but I think you can set it at 10. All right. And for sure, you can drive steadily at 10 miles an hour. Now, that you can do. All right. So what that means is if it's constant speed, even though it's not constant velocity because the direction is changing, but if it's constant speed, the acceleration is going to be perpendicular to the velocity because it's not speeding it up. So it's not, the acceleration isn't slanted toward the velocity or with the velocity. It's not slanted against the velocity. That would slow it down. It's neither speeding up nor slowing down, so it's perpendicular to the velocity. And therefore, the acceleration, okay, here's your circle, here's your center. That acceleration vector in red is going to port point toward that circle. Excuse me. It is going to point toward the center of that imaginary circle, as I've got it sketched out there. Okay? So it, point it points toward the inside of the turn. And this particular acceleration only changes the direction of the velocity, so that's all right. And because we have an acceleration... Uh, we have to have a net force. There's going to be some net force. Might be small, might be large. But it's going to take a little bit of Newtons perpendicular to the velocity to change that direction. All right, so the force, the net force will be pointing toward the center. Now, the size of the net force that produces this acceleration depends on the speed and the tightness of the curve or the radius of curvature. So big radius of curvature, uh, low tightness. Small curvature radius, big tightness. Okay? So think of it this way. If you're, going, if you're taking the turn out here, uh, you're heading west on University, and then you change your mind and you want to go north on Alifea to, uh, to uh, Publix, you have to turn right. And if you take that at 5 miles an hour, it's not a problem. But if you take it at 50 miles an hour, you're going to lose control. Right? Because it takes too much force to keep you on that path than your tires can provide. Same thing with the tightness of the curve. You know, if you, if you travel down the, the interstate, when you, when you come off the interstate, <coughs> excuse me, from 65 miles an hour, they give you a really slow turn off the interstate, usually, because you're traveling at a high rate of speed and a big radius of curvature. So the net force, we're not done yet. The net force is also toward the center of the turn. And the thing that, the thing that um, controls that is basically the friction force from your tires. Now, it's 11.16, we're a minute and a half over. I'm gonna stop here. We'll take up uh, the Nardo ring again on Thursday. You're dismissed, no homework tonight. I'll see you Thursday. And hopefully we'll be able to start faster than today. <laughs>